Okay, so this is image 3850. It's one of thousands of photographs that was taken of the California coastline. Um, does anybody know whose house this is? It's a, it's a tiny house, it's Barbara Streisand's house. Um, she filed a multi-million dollar claim for um, breach of privacy against the website that was hosting this and thousands of other pictures. Um, and when, at the time she filed the complaint, six people had accessed the website and looked at this photo, six. Two of those accessed were by her lawyers. So four other people had looked at this picture. Um, a month after she filed the complaint, one month after she filed the complaint, about 500,000 people had looked at the image. So um, it was coined, this new phrase, the Streisand effect was coined, which means if you try and do something on social media, like if you try and take down a photograph, it can have an unintended consequence, which means that it distributes that content more widely. And that's obviously something that we wanted to avoid. Her claim was successful, but she was trying to stop people accessing the picture and, and that clearly failed. Um, so I have another, yeah, thanks. There it is. So I have a video, um, it's on this one, the link. Um, United Broke My, My Guitar, it's a brilliant video that this, um, oops, musician had an issue with United Airlines. Um, he flew on a flight and um, his guitar was broken and he, he tried to complain and United ignored his complaints so he made this video So the video continues and basically his guitar gets really damaged and the video went viral. I'll just let you watch a bit more. The video is fantastic and it goes on and on, but I, I will let you watch it in your own time. If I can. Um, but so it went viral and 14, 000, um, 14 million people accessed that video um, and United just got hugely bad press from it. Um, and the cost of repairing his guitar would have been nothing. Um, there was a quote that I read in the Times that said, Within four days of the song going viral, the gathering thunderclouds of bad PR caused United Airlines stock price to suffer a mid-flight stall and it plunged 10%, costing shareholders $180 million, which incidentally would have bought Carol more than 51,000 guitars. So sometimes, it, it, I mean, it was a brilliant use of social media um, and yeah, he just got huge press from it. Not brilliant from United. Um, so looking at social media, what's the worst that can happen? How can the risks be mitigated? And we're going to give you some practical tips as well. So social media has evolved. Obviously, traditional websites were just static and you try to attract users to come to your sites and things have really moved on and you're having to um, interact with consumers and people can be critical of your brand and you have to respond um, in a way that doesn't look like a big corporate giant. Um, so, you know, the, it is challenging, the use of social media. Um, the reach is huge. Um, I found some good statistics, which is that uh, Facebook has a billion users, 500 million are active users. And if we compare that to the New York Times, which has less than 1 million, um, a circulation of less than 1 million, it just shows the, the scale of it. So what are the risks? There's um, potential brand damage. Uh, loss of followers and loss of customers, liability for infringing content, defamation, breach of privacy. And we're looking at interaction both with your customers, but also your employees. So your employees um, using social media on your behalf. We've got some good examples of that, which is the Burger King example. I'm not sure if you can see this picture. It's um, a photograph that went viral of an employee at Burger King standing in two trays of lettuce. Um, and obviously Burger King was horrified that this photo went viral. 
um, they reacted really quickly. They had a social media policy, and within 24 hours, they had identified the shop, that identified the outlet, they had identified the employee, they'd fired him, and they'd put up a notice on, on um, social media saying how you know, apologetic they were and how this thing will not be, to this kind of conduct won't be tolerated. Um, so that's a really good example of some, something really awful happening, huge potential brand damage, um, but how quickly Burger King was able to respond. The last time we did this um, for another media client, a client who's got a media business, remember they were talking about the use of passwords and whose voice um, within the organisation can yeah. represent the company from a social media perspective. And so there's something very practical down to, if you're setting up um, you know, a Facebook page with a country link, make sure you, you send the password back to legal or to central so that if you leave, we're able to actually control that account. And there was also interesting discussions about how the policy had evolved and who was authorised to respond to tweets on behalf of the company. Um, and I was quite surprised for an organisation of that size how, how controlled the voice was. You know, there was only one or two people allowed to respond. Um, even yeah. Though dealt with the country. And you have to think about how your company wants to respond. So. Um, uh, um, Tesco Mobile in the UK is a really, it, it uses social media in a really um, kind of brave way. Um, there was a tweet that I saw that someone wrote at Tesco Mobile using, um, if a girl was using Tesco Mobile, it's such a turn off. And then they responded quickly afterwards saying, um, you know, how's your, you know, have you got a girlfriend? Or it was very quick but that could go wrong very easily. So you have to take your policy and decide who's implementing it and do they have the ability to respond in that, in that way or are you better off just being safe? <laughs> um, so yeah, there's potential reputational damage and um, loss of control. So using social, media, using social media, you lose control compared to traditional use of websites. Um, your consumers are talking about your brand and you can't, they're not gonna, say positive things all the time. Um, so you have to balance how you control that and how you respond. Um, it's also 24 hours a day. So the, the example of uh, Burger King, where they were able to respond within 24 hours is really impressive considering um, time zones and, and everything. So you have to balance between putting your brand out there, which everyone wants and social media can't be avoided, but also exercising control without being seen as a big corporate bully. Um, this is um, linked to Joyce's comment about controlling username and passwords. Um, I'm not sure if you can see these tweets, but it was from HMV, and it's from the official HMV Twitter feed. Um, we're tweeting live from HR where we're all being fired. Exciting. <laughs> and then the next one was, just overheard our marketing director, he's staying, folks, ask, how do I shut down Twitter? So, I mean, th this is a key example of how you want to um, make sure you've got control of all your social media before you do a big redundancy. <laughs> um, so the risks under UAE law are IP infringement, so that could be either your rights being infringed, third parties using your content on social media, but also your official account, whether you have to check whether you're using photographs or a third party content with permission. Um, defamation, which we'll look at, image rights and privacy, um, obscene offensive content, which is obviously really important in this region. Breach of confidentiality, if you say we've just signed something before it's the public launch. Um, and again, reputational damage, which we've looked at. Um, some issues to consider are that social media, media is global in nature, but there's no international law that applies. So it can be difficult to advise. You have to look at the, like Joyce has said, the terms of use, the jurisdictions that are relevant. Um, there's no single internet law. Um, and you have to be mindful that, especially in this region, you could be held liable as the publisher of content. So there was a website that I read about called magen.net, and the owner of that website was jailed. The owner of the website was jailed for a third party posting defamatory content on his website. Um, he, it was turned over an appeal, but he was jailed for five months. Um, so, so unlike in the EU, where you've got safe harbour provisions, um, if you're not actually actively involved in the infringement, you can't hide behind those two. Yeah, it's strict liability. You can't say, I didn't know about it. Here, there's no such defense. So looking at some <coughs> copyright myths. Um, 
so copyright is what I do. I, I it's my practice area, and I often hear people um, saying, oh, "I've just taken this image from Google Images," or um, "It's okay because I'm using it on social media. Everyone does it." Um, and there's this mis huge misconception that because photographs or any contents on the internet, it can be shared. There are exceptions. So if someone's put the picture on social media, you can reshare. But as a person putting a photograph on Twitter, you must have permission if it's not your photograph. Um, so yeah, these are the copyright myths that photographs are on the internet, so they can be used. Um, you, they can be used if you um, for if you don't use them for commercial purposes. Again, that's not right. Um, and as long as you credit the photographer, it's okay. Also not right. Um, and these myths have led to prolific infringement on the internet, not just by individuals, but by companies as well. So using, like I said, um, just downloading images from Google Images and using them in PowerPoints or in companies' promotional materials, um, and that is copyright infringement. Um, so here's a, an example of even media giants getting it wrong. Um, there was the BBC, used photographs from various um, uh, events that, that were posted on Twitter. So people were out and about and took photographs, and the BBC used those photographs without permission. Um, and they got a complaint from someone that said, your reporting of this evening's riots in Tottenham included photographs which you said were from Twitter. You may have found them from, from that website, but they would have been hosted elsewhere and taken by a photographer whom you did not name and whose copyright you may have breached. You've done this with other news stories, such as the Oslo attacks. This is not acceptable. In future, please give proper credit to photographers. And the BBC's response said, Twitter is a social network platform which is available to most people who have a computer. So they've responded in quite a condescending way, on, which is pub, you know, public. People can see this. Twitter is a social network platform which is available to most people who have a computer, and therefore any content on it is not subject to the same copyright laws as it's already in the public domain. So they, this, that is completely not true. So they've, one, they've infringed, and then they've condescended the person that's flagged it to them, and they've got the law wrong. Um, they then, I haven't got it here, but they then issued an apology and said that um, they try where possible to credit photographers, but um, they have you know, a public interest of, of reporting on news. Um, but it does show that even a, there's a fundamental lack of copyright knowledge, even in huge media companies. This is one that's closer to home. Um, there was reports in the press that um, lots of the photographs on De Bizzel were infringing, and a local photographer resorted to Twitter to try and stop this infringement. So rather than going to lawyers, he just, as you would with a product complaint, you know, that's a, you know, a way that people now complain about products, just put it out there so that the company can see. And he said, do at De Bizzle have anything to say regarding their ongoing willful copyright infringement? Again, De Bizzle's take was um, incorrect and tried to rely on the safe harbor um, defenses in the US and the UK, which is you're not liable until you've got knowledge, which do doesn't apply here. So they were saying, as soon as we're in re informed of infringing content, we take it down, which is not actually the law here. But it, again, it shows um, it's a good practical example of how you can try and mitigate the risk. So, the business issue was um, I'm selling my car, I can't be bothered taking a photo of it, so I'll just go to the Volvo website and mm -hmm. download a photo of the 2006 and I'll put it up there. Well, that infringes the copyright of Volvo or whoever owns the rights to that photograph. Um, Dubizzo have now got software on their, um, their website, so sometimes you'll see image not approved or it's being uploaded. So they've got a system where they can basically trawl for images which appear elsewhere on the internet. So that they've demonstrated up front that they've taken steps to try and clear copyright. And then from the takedown perspective, they will say, yes, we, we can't vet every image that's uploaded. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it's come from. I can't clear the rights. But we have taken it down as soon as we've become aware of the issue. And therefore, the loss that the owner of the rights could have suffered, we have taken steps to help mitigate. Yeah, and that's the same approach as YouTube would take, putting their the fingerprints on for um, infringing content. And it really is actually the best that DeBizzle can do to minimise their liability. But it's just interesting um, seeing the different um, laws, and it's just highlighting again that different laws apply. So in the US and the UK, they would be acting lawfully by taking it down. Here, there's a question about that. 
This is another example of um, where brands resort to Twitter to enforce their rights. So where traditionally for an IP infringement, you would go to your lawyers and report it, they'd send a warning letter. This is an independent jewellery designer, um, Tati Devine, who created, um, these are two examples of her jewellery designs. Um, but there was about 10 or so. The, the, these ones on the right are um, designs that were being sold by Claire's Accessories. Um, and there were, this is just two of multiple examples where she felt, quite rightly, so that her rights were being infringed. Uh, so she started a campaign on social media and eventually uh, Claire's Accessories took notice and stopped producing the same, stopped copying her designs effectively. And what is wonderful about this is the fact that lawyers were not near this. Mm -hmm. She's been able to use a free forum um, to basically demonstrate the infringement of her copyright and possibly trademark design rights and use um, you know, the wealth of social media to basically drive a response that the lawyers may not have been able to achieve. Yeah. And it generated great publicity for her as well. So defamation, you have to also be careful when you're posting anything on social media that could be defamatory. So um, defamation is a statement which is made publicly that risks um, that the operator of the website may, the risk is that the, sorry, dis, a statement which dishonors or discredits the person in the mind of the general public. And that statement has to be made publicly. And as we've discussed, the operator of the website could be held liable. Um, that's punish defamation is punishable by a fine or imprisonment. So you have to make sure that any statements you may make obviously um, don't dishonor or harm a person's reputation. Um, there's also reports in the press that, um, that a claim was filed against an Emirati who allegedly defamed um, the, uh, someone in the Dubai police on, on Twitter. So ac the enforcement authorities here are taking action against um, social media and they're considering it the same as um, publications in newspapers or elsewhere. Um, the copyright law sets out um, con stuff, um, provisions relating to the use of photographs, but there's also um, high, as you'd expect, high um, th threshold of laws relating to privacy. Um, so it's an offence under the publications law to publish anything which is harmful to Islam, contrary to public morals, which harms the interests of the state, anything which is about an individual's private or family life, or anything that's confidential and that damages the reputation or wealth of a person. So that is much wider than defamation. So those, those could be true. You could publish a statement um, that is about a pri an individual's private or family life, which is true, um, but that's an offence under UA law. So um, you should also be obtaining written consent before publishing photographs. Um, ex and the, uh, the exception to that is where the photograph was taken in a public place or is of a famous person um, or if it's that the publication is permitted by public authorities. Um, and that's true of whether, um, obtaining consents for the use of photographs or films. So that's me yep. taking other images, isn't it, and saying, I like that, or that's something, that, and that, and that, that, that's literally making other people. That yeah, way. yeah, and you're linking, so you're on a website and you link it and say, pin this to Pinterest. Usually, most stuff on Pinterest is pinned from commercial companies that want that exposure, don't they? They want you pin, pinning something from, I don't know, Pottery Barn's website or an uh, independent designer with a cool t-shirt, and they, they probably won't take action because they want the, that exposure and then more people, it will drive more people to their site. But arguably, the photographer that took that picture has licensed it to that website. Um, but I think it would be very unlikely that anyone would take action because you're, you're using it in a, in a way that they'll be happy with. But it, you, technically, yeah. So the, in the copyright law, there's a provision that says anyone that takes a photograph of another has no right to save, exhibit, publish, or distribute that photograph without permission of the subject. Again, the exceptions, as I mentioned on the previous slide, are that where the photograph was taken at a public event or is of a famous person. Other than that, for films and photographs, you should be getting written consents before you use those photographs. I think that's a really important exception because it's under UA law, which we don't see in other ones. So to use a practical example, if I'm a photographer and I take a photo of Harriet, not at a public event, even though I own the copyright of the photograph, 
Harry, as the subject of the photograph, has individual rights that should be searched as separate from the underlying copyright that I own. Yeah, sorry, this provision does go on to say, um, so it says you can't use a photograph unless you get consent, but the subject of the photograph can use that photograph. So if I get a headshot taken at Clyde & Co and I want to use that picture, I don't have to get permission from the photographer to use it on LinkedIn or anywhere else. The photograph's of me and I can authorise the publication of that. Even though I own the copyright. Yeah, exactly. What? What about if there's an agreement to the contrary between the photographer and the, and the subject? Yeah. Right, so if I take a picture of you as a photographer and I say, in exchange for taking this picture, I own all the rights and you assign your underlying right to me. I mean, contractually, we can, you can change the relationships, right? You can con change it, but that provision says clearly that... Um, so the photographer, you're right, the photographer, sh photographer should get written consent from the subject but the subject has a statutory right to use that photograph themselves. For any purpose? It, yeah, it doesn't limit the purpose. But you, you can... You contractually will, limit it, no. I don't think you could contractually limit that. I think it's a statutory right that's it clear in the law. Um, but you could say, you could contractually agree, yeah, you could, agree, you could try and agree a waiver and you could say you agree that the photograph will only be used for this purpose exclusively by me. And then the parties if they understand that, then, they, then you know, ho hopefully the other person wouldn't use it. But I'd have to look more closely at the provision. But what you've raised is another issue on the copyright law, which deals with prohibition on assignment of future rights. So under the UAE law, we've got a um, very practical provision which says that if I sign, if, if I commission you to take some photographs, um, and my contract says that everything that I, every photograph that I take for you will be owned by me as the photographer. Um, doesn't work unless the work has been created. So it's so the so the the law the provision says um, you can't assign copyright in five or more future works. So which means um, if I'm commissioning someone to create one work and I enter into a commissioning agreement in advance and I say I want Rob to design draw a picture for me. Um, but you've not yet done it, but I want to own copyright, that's fine, it's effective, it's less than five works. But if I say I want Rob to design a whole book, and the book's comprised photographs, written works, there's lots of different things, lots of different copyright works in that book, and I enter into a contract with Rob and say I will own copyright in the book, it's more than five works, so that copyright, that assignment will not be effective because it's a future work, it's not yet been created. Once the book's created, we can enter into an agreement and assign copyright. And the reason the law has that is um, the copyright UAE copyright law is based on the French code. And the French code is very pro-authors compared to the US and the UK law, which is based on common law and much more pro-business. So the UAE law is pro-artists, so you always have to remember that the law is there to try and protect artists' rights. Um, do you want to add to that? Yeah, but it might be worth just uh, add, trying to put pauses all together because there are so many rights around here. And uh, uh, are you going to talk about moral rights? In a um, no, I'm not. I wasn't going to. Um, it, 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 I, I can see it in the front row, but you probably can't see the back row. Um, that, that photograph um, has a couple of words underneath it. Uh, I assume that's the author's name. Yeah, Jane um, McGinney. McGinney. So, so, so the, the, the photographer, they can't wait. They have more moral rights than they. Uh, and that's a right to have their name against the photograph. It's taken by them that, that they should be... The right to be named as the author. Mm -hmm. Actually attributed to them. Um, so <coughs> all of these rights floating around, uh, who owns the, the copyright, uh, the, the subject of the photo has rights, the photographer has rights. Uh, some of those rights can be waived and transferred, some can't be. Um, and and the, the answer is, when you're trying to work out, when you're trying to um, produce something or commission something, got to work out uh, how you want to use it, who should have rights, and then put in place the appropriate waivers or, or assignments to try, to try to achieve what you want to achieve. In some cases you can do that, in some cases you can't. Um, so uh, often with, um, say, um, people coming, coming through town, uh, producers from out of town, um, they say, well, this is a show we're producing, this is what we want to achieve, and we'll produce the appropriate waiver for them, uh, and, and say, in addition to the waiver, uh, this is what you can and can't do. You can do everything you want to do, but actually you can't do everything. 
Um, so, so it depends on, on what they're trying to achieve. And we've got workarounds. So if, for example, the future assignment thing is an issue, but what we would do is attach an assignment and say, once the work's all being produced and everyone's happy with it and it's signed off as a condition of payment, you'll sign this assignment, which transfers all the rights to us. So there are workarounds, um, but it's just, it's just good to know. Um, so how we can mitigate, mitigate the risks of social media. You have to respect third party rights. Um, so when you're posting third party content, think, do I have permission? Am I allowed to post this? Um, use photo libraries. So Creative Commons images, you can do a Google search using Creative Commons images Google search, and then that will give you images that you can use either for a small, well, they, you can use them for free, in fact, actually, um, for commercial purposes. Um, make sure that login details are kept centrally and secure. Uh, social media policies are a good idea, as we've seen from that Burger King example. Um, training employees so they know how to respond to a crisis, a social media crisis. And just be careful because social media disputes can play out in public. Okay, can I just uh, add, add something else here? Just, uh, um, uh, Harry and I were talking after a presentation she gave uh, a few months ago, uh, and there were two lawyers at the presentation. It was uh, in relation to, to art, wasn't it? Uh, and the client said afterwards, Would you mind if I put to your slides on, on a website? And Harry said, Fine, absolutely, because all those photographs are all clear. Uh, the other lawyer said, actually, no, but because he hadn't cleared his photographs. Uh, and it's kind of embarrassing for a lawyer not having cleared his copyrights uh, in photographs and presentations. Um, and and, and it, it's a kind of a minor embarrassment for the client, for the lawyer not being said to say to the client, you can't use these photographs. Uh, but in, in another set of circumstances, that might chat actually so, someone sitting in the audience saying, you know what, I know that photograph, uh, and you can get yourself in quite a lot of trouble. Uh, so it's so a clearing photographs. Uh, it's it, it mitigate risks by clearing, it, by mm -hmm. clearing photographs. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a good example of an IP infringement playing out in public. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the North Face. Um, this was the South Butt that was created by a teenager, a parody, obviously clothing line. Um, and North Face sent a warning letter. The teenager put it online. So then you know, it went completely viral. The warning letter was very formal and um, everyone kind of sided with the young teenage guy trying to make um, some extra cash before he went to university. Uh, and it was a huge wave of support for this teenager. North Face ignored the backlash, just kept going, filed a claim against him for infringement, and then they settled, um, but for an undisclosed amount. Uh, so they did dis receive, um, achieve their outcome, which was to stop the use of the infringing <coughs> logo, but they damaged their brand. And what was before seen as quite a cool brand was seen by a lot of people as a corporate bully. So just be careful, um, fight social media fires with uh, social media um, water, really. Just be, be sensitive to the way you handle any disputes. Um, so just for the IP infringement, so as I've said, you, educate employees, tell them about how to monitor content, about what content should be posted and when they shouldn't post content. If there's critical, um, Social, if people are using social media to criticize your brand or your product, don't just block it. That's not the answer. Lots of companies, um, I think uh, Nestle was, um, was, uh, had received bad press for just taking down posts that were about their use of palm oil. Um, and that was received huge public backlash. Um, they were just taking down any post that wasn't positive. Um, and then that just got, you know, the problem just gets exacerbated. Um, obtain permission before using third party content, like I've said, photo libraries. Had a, have a dedicated social media team um, for a user account so you can get web, um, anyone can, those, that team can access social media with usernames and account login details kept centrally. Just in case the person that's currently holding those details leaves under bad cir circumstances. And then this is just some social media policies. I've drafted some for clients and they're a good idea. They can be very high level just so that people remember the ideas and um, more information about how to actually respond. But again, just highlighting what content you shouldn't post. So when you're using social media, you've got to be mindful of 
third party rights. And I've just done a couple of slides highlighting the different IP rights. So trademarks, which Joyce here will talk about in a minute, are names, words, or other marks that identify goods and services. And it's basically what keeps you different from your competitors, distinguishing your products. Copyright protects um, works that are original. So um, you can have copyright in databases or website design fonts. You can have it in photographs, illustrations, music, obviously, audiovisual content. Uh, copyright could be the most important right for everyone in this room. Mm -hmm. um, conceptually, it's an idea where it's the most amorphous of the rights because it automatically exists upon creation, assuming it's original. Um, you don't have to register it, although you can in certain jurisdictions, but what's important to remember about copyright is that there is no copyright in an idea. So clients will always ring us and say, someone's infringed my idea, and you say, well, what's your idea? And one I got last week was selling beauty products online. So, well, that's actually, I, I'm sure it's a very good idea, I'm sure the website's very successful, but when you drill down to what's been infringed, it's someone's literally copied from someone else, someone's taken photographs mm -hmm. from someone else, someone's breached a contract in terms of um, disclosing information they have access to. So there are more pointy forms of copyright, but in terms of the media space, we're looking at content, we're looking at films, we're looking at music, we're looking at scores. Um, it's probably the most important right if you're on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, and there are nuances under UA law about ownership of copyright, and we could do a whole other session on that um, itself. I think if you look at copyright, you try to work out what copyright is. It's anything which can be recorded whether it's written down, captured in a photograph, put onto an electronic form of media, it's, it's anything that can be captured. So if you distinguish the idea being something in the clouds to something that you actually... The expression of that idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so patents, which um, are a monopoly right over an invention, um, products like a, pro a product or the process manufacturing method. Um, there's also design rights, which can be registered here rights in confidential information, and then domain, domain names, which link into trademark rights. <coughs> so I'll hand over to Joyce here now to look at trademarks. Yeah, so Twitter has um, terms and conditions which, which say when you join Twitter, um, if you tweet something, you give permission to, re to people to retweet. So there are exceptions in that there's the basic a kind of framework structure of IP law, and then on top of that, there's the terms and conditions of each website and platform. Yeah, so that would be potentially infringement. That that would be an infringement. The photographer would have to um, come to you directly. Yeah, it it would be an infringement if you're if the original post, original tweet was infringing. Mm -hmm. But it's difficult. So sorry, it's just difficult to for them to actually take action, unless you know, if if it's just constantly being retweeted, it would be difficult for the photographer. Um, before we sort of change the tack a bit and look more um, on the detail basis of the IP rights, have you got any questions that are thrown out on the social media slides? One question about establishing jurisdiction of where you know you might need to sort of work out which laws apply and, 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 and whether or not there's been infringement. So with, with so many online and mobile applications, what, to what degree is it important to understand where the servers are based, where the actual physical sort of posting, as it were, is happening? Or, and, and, and how does that relate to the issue of where the publishing decision is? So I've decided to post something from here in the UAE, but it might be on a server in another country. So where, where, where is the appropriate sort of uh, jurisdiction focus on? Well, it, I guess it depends. You can The UAE courts will, prob will accept jurisdiction over a huge range of, of disputes, anything basically that happens here. So if you wanted to bring a claim here because the laws were more favorable to you, as long as the content's available here, the courts would accept jurisdiction. Um, but I guess because of where the servers are based, you could also look at the laws in that country and decide to take action there. Yeah, I, I, when we look at this, you, you tend to look to a client and say, well, where are you vulnerable? Um, and if you're headquartered here, you're vulnerable here. Um, and, yeah, and Harry is absolutely right. The, uh, the courts here do not require much of a hesitation, don't take much hesitation in, uh, in acting uh, in terms of taking jurisdiction. So if you're, if you're based here, uh, here is very relevant. If, if your servers are in Europe, 
uh, say in Italy, uh, Italian law could be could be relevant, uh, particularly if you're if you're putting data through there. Uh, so, so uh, and the third place where it could be relevant is if you are uh, targeting a particular country. Um, so so there's a, there's a case um, in in Europe where the servers and the websites are all hosted in Ireland, uh, but they're actually targeted in the UK. Uh, so nothing was happening in the UK apart from the website was targeting the UK. And, and the UK courts had no hesitation, took jurisdiction, because the infringement was directed uh, at, at, at uh, the UK. Um, so you tend to work out where, where the crime is vulnerable, headquarters, operations, uh, and then worry about if, if, you can, uh, if the court would take action in those particular countries. We find, sorry, not, not sure, but we, you know, we, we find sometimes when we're, um, we do quite a bit with YouTube, and so YouTube's policy is um, they, they fall back on the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act yeah. in the States. And so their default position generally is that um, if it's okay by the DMCA, then it's fine everywhere else, irrespective of whether the content was uploaded here or it's targeted here. I mean, that's yeah. Google as an organization's position. Um, and it sort of leaves a bit of, a lot of ambiguity in and around um, if you take down content on YouTube uh, the process is that the person who might have infringed your rights has the right to appeal it by saying um, I think that the person who pulled down my content is wrong I am the owner of this content and so I'm appealing it and then so asking for the content to be put back to up? To be re reinstated. And if you don't file a legal case against them, it gets reinstated, as per the DMCA rules. Mm -hmm. And so it's always been interesting to me as to how that applies in this region where that ambiguity is, because um, so know, I, just I, I don't necessarily think that DMC, DMCA rules need apply over here, but that's the sort of position that Google takes. So I'd be interested to hear your views on. I think unless um, I, th I think that they have to think of a it works in the US because that's the framework that's the laws in the US um, and so they've just applied the same model globally um, and you're right local laws will impact their ability to rely on that defense um, until someone brings a big claim against them for infringement. It's fine for Google to adopt um, an international US centric based policy but the reality is Google's here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whether it's got service here or not, it's got employees in the UAE. And from that perspective, you've got to look at what's happening in this jurisdiction from a UAE framework. And we've acted for um, global media companies who have a presence here. We've been doing very practical things like kind of door and raid policy for a media client, where it's, if there is strict liability applied under these laws, and we face you know, the ability the general manager on the trade license could go to jail because of something posted on, through use generated content, what is our response? Um, and we can show things like takedown policies, but the Digital Millennium Act's not going to help Google in the DMC, in Media City when the police turn up to say you're liable for something that we say has happened in this jurisdiction. So, so what is your fallback, though? Your fallback is that you have to file a legal case, or can you go, just go straight to the police or something like that? Um, all of the offences under the IP laws here are criminal, so we actually have the ability to go directly to the police to bring um, and that always, that, I think that's very important to bear in mind when you're looking at infringement in this jurisdiction. And from Google's perspective or, or any other sort of international media company, I think you've just got to be mindful of um, whether your international practices, whether your defences that you hold up internationally actually will shield you in a jurisdiction like this. You know, when we're acting for clients like that, we will say international practice practices is, we've got safe harbour provisions elsewhere which we can rely on. US law says this, and that sort of helps paint a picture about how good a global corporate citizen we are. But the reality is, we've seen cases where those types of defences don't really hold. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. I mean, maybe just, just to add to that, I, mean, I think we're all here, uh, one way or another, because um, the authorities here want to develop media. Uh, you develop media, you develop social media, um, and the bar is impossible. We, we, we can't. Um, uh, clear every content before it goes online. Uh, so, so what do you do? You set in place these policies, you follow the 2454 dis dissemination guidelines, um, you 
mitigate as much as you can. Uh, you take down as quick as you can, and you clear beforehand when you can. Uh, and if, if there's then a problem, at least you can say, we've done what we can. And actually, it, here we are actually trying to create a medium industry. So, so the answer is, uh, from the lawyers, it's, it's not a point of don't go online. It's a question of how you go online and how you uh, uh, put out content in a way that's suitable for your business. Uh, but equally, uh, you have some defensive measures in place. And, and uh, what we've done with uh, Joyce is saying about CEOs uh, being vulnerable to go, going to jail because uh, they're managing a the business, we put it through a different company. Uh, it, it, it's operated through, through a separate company to distance uh, senior management from any potential liability. So there's things you can do, uh, but it, it's, it's always that balancing act here that there's an overriding need to actually run the business. And their takedown policy is so effective that you have infringing content, you know, it is a workaround that you, you report the infringing content. I see what you're saying about people appealing, but... Can I ask a question between the nature of agencies and, um, and clients? So if, if we run an agency, if we're posting social media on behalf of that client and the client's approved everything but then there's an issue with it, is the agency uh, liable or is it the client that's approved it? That's a difficult one. Um, you'd be, you're posting it in the client's name. Yeah. You could, a claim could be brought against both, effectively, because it's the publisher of the... So let's say one of the posts was defamatory. A claim could be brought against the individual person that put, posted it, and then they could add other defendants as well. Okay. Like the, the name... It's publicly in, in the line. If, you, if we were looking to bring a claim, it would probably be the publisher. You know, yeah. The person who's associated. So we've done recently something for um, a, a client where an agency produced... A, campaign where there was a claim to um, the Michelin star status attaching to a particular service and it wasn't Michelin star rated and there are you know, Michelin star is protected as a trademark in the EU. Um, our client luckily came to us and we cleared it and stopped it before it went public but I guess the issues you've raised there are both contractual so there should be an agreement between you and the client which says um, who is responsible for infringement but when you're looking at the act of publication it's probably going to be who can be identified as um, the maker of that statement. Mm -hmm. right. okay. So we're just going to quickly flick through um, yes. trademarks here. Harriet sort of started off just identifying the various bases of IP. Um, I'm just going to spend a bit of time looking at trademarks and, and how we can look at trademarks in the media context to really see the types of rights that are being created and the value that's being created. Do you want to swap rights. seats? Just the right arrow. Or the down arrow. So if we look at IP as valuable assets, this um, slide basically shows the Coca-Cola model. And in 2008-2009, the Coca-Cola company's balance sheet um, really demonstrated the value of intangible assets. So in that year, trademarks with indefinite lives were valued at just over six million US dollars. Goodwill was valued at just under four million, and the combined value of those two intangible assets was 23% of the company's balance sheet. So no bottling plant, no employee, no physical assets that you would traditionally associate with the asset side of um, balance sheet um, came from IP. And I think that number is even higher now. So with that in mind, I've just got a few slides which really look at how um, trademark assets are identified, protected, and how they're commercialised. Um, Intel is an interesting one. I think if we look at trademarks, can I borrow your bottle? Yep. As a source of origin. So this bottle has the word Masafi on it and a logo. And it's basically a badge of origin. It shows everyone that when you buy this bottle, it's come from Masafi and that there is value associated with that brand. You know, it's a water bottle from the foothills of the Masafi. Um, Mountains. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think where it really gets interesting for trademarks is identifying infringements of protection and where people are pushing innovation to identify their brands. Guesses? 20th Century Fox. That's registered as a trademark. 
the USPTO. Um, it's a very old trademark, it's registered with effect from 17 September 1996, but that is, as you've identified, badge of origin, which demonstrates um, that that string of chord or that, that musical score with the source of the films that are produced from that company. And it's really interesting that in 1996, 20th Century Fox Film Fair, um, saw the value in protecting the score as a means of identifying goods. When I was practising in Australia, we actually acted for Fox, and what they registered in Australia was the musical score, so the notes on the, um, on the score. Can we just go back to the other one? Oh, it didn't play. This one. Anyway, there's um, a sound chord behind this, but the Intel B was also registered. Ding, ding, ding. Um, 1999 again, and what they did there in terms of identifying to the public what the scope of that trademark is, is the mark consists of a five-tone audio progression of the notes D flat, D flat, G, D flat, and A flat. So it clearly said to everyone what the Intel Bing was, so you could see the nature of that right. The Tiffany Blue is registered as a colour trademark. Um, there are a number of ways that you can protect colour trademarks. Tiffany has <coughs> a broader perspective, so their claim to this monopoly is the mark consists of a shade of blue, often referred to as Robin's Egg Blue, used on boxes. Um, now, you know, we take the word off there, and all the women or men in this room see the colour, see the box, and you know exactly where it's come from. So again, it's a use of colour to identify a source of goods. The UPS Brown also registered as a trademark, but they adopted a very different approach. So they've actually claimed a specific Pantone colour, 46 to see as being the colour that you see on all of those trucks and uniforms. Again, you see the UPS man or woman dressed in the brown of the truck, you know that is different from the DHL red and yellow. Sorry, two minutes. Yeah. I'm trying to understand how you um, register a trademark for a colour that kind of exists in the, the <coughs> domain as a says a, yeah. a Pantone colour which you can pick from any sort of software app. Does that mean you can't use that colour in a particular circumstance? I mean, how are you protected? Exactly. It means that the companies that have been able to protect colour rights, and there's been a, a huge trademark war over the protection of the colour purple in relation to chocolate. This is not registered in the purple in relation to chocolate. Uh, not here. No. Um, and there's been a lot of turf wars in the trademark perspective about people trying to claim a monopoly right over colours. Now, what Tiffany will say is this is a particular shade of blue and that they have demonstrated that they've um, acquired distinctiveness in this. So they've done, there's enough um, basically sales of goods by reference to this blue that people now identify the blue as coming from them. And for someone else to use the blue in relation to the same goods or services is an infringement of the rights that they've developed. So in principle, yes, colour should be free for everyone to use. The Pantone is the Pantone. But UPS have, have invested a lot in identifying their brand and the delivery of transport services and related goods with Pantone 462C. So I think it, they're, they're difficult trademarks to register. Um, I don't think you get them immediately just by filing the rights. I think in the US you've got to show evidence of use and demonstrate you, in the trademark sense, acquired distinctiveness in the colour. Um, and it is very difficult to do because people are still struggling even though we might walk down the supermarket aisle and, and see purple and think immediately Cadbury or um, we see green and we see BP for um, petrol services. So it's not easy to do and the people that have succeeded in doing it have really got critical mass around demonstrating um, that recognition which is associated with the trademark. This one is really hard to see <coughs> but I'll read it to you. It's um, basically a series of leaves and it's for the Western Hotel the tagline is, white tea, the calming new scent of Western, this is how it should feel. And what I love about this is the combination of marks in there. You've got you see, digital imagery in um, all the copyright and the photograph. You've got um, white tea, which is a product. So Western could conceivably pump the scent of white tea through its lobbies and you could walk into a hotel and say, oh, I'm in a Western. Um, so it's using scent to identify its brand and differentiate it from other competitors. And then you've got a sensory mark, this is how it should feel. So I like that because it just it captures a lot of innovation in the trademark sense and how people are trying to differentiate themselves from just putting logos of products. So how can you protect your trademarks? This is just a really sort of practical end to um, how we you produce good defensible brands. 
Um, first one is basically identify your trademark and identify distinctive marks. People love descriptive marks, but the real value is in marks like Google, um, which don't tell you what it is that is being provided under the, the goods or services. So Google, Apple, Xerox are all, um, we say, strong trademarks which, which don't tell the consumer what's being provided. Um, consider adding distinctive elements such as logos or designs. So if we look at this, this is a spectrum of um, distinctiveness. A weak trademark here is carpet land. No guesses there for what you find when you go into that store. Um, the middle part of the spectrum has no relevant meaning, and that's the Apple um, logo. And then a strong trademark is Kodak. Again, it doesn't tell you anything about the services or goods that Kodak sells. Then you have to identify your key markets. There is no protection internationally for trademarks. You actually have to go into, there are a number of um, jurisdictions where you can get protection, for example, throughout the EU. But in principle, you have to go and register in each country. So if I've got a trademark registered here and someone's infringing in the US, I don't necessarily have rights to enforce my registration there. I'm going to go back to this first slide. Um, when I first started working with Chip Beauty for seven years ago, we were sat around the table with Tony Austin, the former CEO, and he'd come from Viacom, and we were talking about you know this new brand they've been developed. It's in the storyboards, and I've used this without copyright acknowledgement. But his, his catchphrase in terms of how 2454 is growing, he says, I want to fill an empty vessel with brand identity. So if we look at you know, a bottle as an analogy, he wanted to basically create something which was empty from the beginning and, and fill it with something which he could identify as what is now the media zone. So I think that's a really useful way of um, looking at what you, you should be approaching when you're trying to create strong brands. Joyce, can I just uh, add something? Yeah. Since, uh, uh, just in Google uh, uh, up on there, um, and Google have a, a very good relationship with the legal team they created, because every day you go onto Google, it's different. Uh, I, I watched it yesterday, and there's a little O, uh, a big O, hand in hand with little O, because it was Father's Day, and they're off to the football, uh, World Cup Day. Uh, and the way they generate uh, different images every day, it gives it attractive, keys generating, uh, uh, right in Google, um, and actually broadens rights out from a lawyer's perspective is great, but creators' perspective is great as well, uh, and, and that balance, particularly in, in, in media, uh, is very, very important. So trademarks, a very sort of um, top level view is, trademarks are protected on a national basis, they are protected through a classification system, so if I have registered water and Masafi in relation to water products, it doesn't necessarily protect me if someone sells the Safi brand of jewellery because you actually have to, to protect in each of the 45 classes to demonstrate that you've got that protection. Um, sample specification again, which we can't read, this is 2454's claim in classes 35, 38, 41 in the EU. So again, it's a very detailed description of the goods and services that you'll be providing under that trademark. And then there's a registration process, which I won't go into. Um, Another practical example of how we best defend trademarks is that <coughs> I think we say use it or lose it. It's no point in having a fantastic portfolio if A, you're not using the trademarks, or B, you're not using the trademarks in the form in which they're registered. Sometimes clients will come to us with an enforcement matter and they give us the trademark certificate and then they show us the examples of the infringing products and they're different because they've not taken the steps to make sure that the business is actually using what um, has been registered from a trademark perspective. Um, trademarks become generic through improper use. So Google is the most classic example of it's become a verb. No one says do an internet search anymore. Everyone says Google it. Um, take an aspirin. That proper use of that trademark should be take an aspirin tablet. Um, stick on a Band-Aid. Plaster. Hoover that up with you. You know, they've become generic uses of words which cover an activity rather than when you say Hoover, it doesn't mean I'm going to buy a Hoover branded vacuum cleaner. It's just for cleanup. Um, pass me a Kleenex, where's the cello tape? So from a business perspective, you've got to protect the value in the trademark and make sure that it's used properly so the value is not undermined. And then lastly, um, just some, some tips for using trademarks. Again, use distinctive trademarks, um, add elements to it which do distinguish them from your competitors' brands, use them in a form in which they're registered, 
The TM symbol can be used um, generally in relation to trademarks which are the subject of a pending application or which are unregistered. And in some jurisdictions, including in the UAE, if you're involved, you can only use the R when the trademark has actually proceeded to registration. As Harriet said, we could do a whole other session on copyrights alone on, or trademarks alone, but we've tried really to look at the main rights that arise throughout the use of social media. Um, I hope you found it helpful, and if you've got any questions generally on any of the slides, we can take now or after the session. Um, coming back to the, there's a couple of issues on the content creation, I think which are, most of us in this room are probably all content creators. Um, a lot of the time the clients want us to assign permanent rights to them. So for example, if we film some footage of their facilities, <coughs> they want to then be able to use it in other material. But you said it can only be used five times, unless it's written into the contract that they... Sorry, that's, I, I wasn't clear. Okay. Um, you, can, you can agree how the rights in that content will be owned. Um, but there are issues under UA law about the assignment of future rights. So um, you can agree either to grant the commissioner an assignment of copyright, so they own, or a license to use, so you can both use, you know, you can retain the rights and they can use, there's lots of different ways you can, you can deal with the rights. Um, if you're creating multiple works, so more than five works, in order to assign validly under UAE law, you have to assign after the works have been created. But you can agree in advance, the part, you know, this is commercial world, like you're gonna, they want, they're commissioning you and they want to own. So you're agreeing to that. It's just after the works have been created so that they can demonstrate ownership of that work, you just sign a form saying, now I'm assigning. Okay, and, and another subject, you were talking about the subjects of uh, like uh, people that are being photographed or videoed. Can we make the company responsible for that? For example, if a company has asked us to come in and film in their offices, there might be 100 people sitting in that office and we're just going to... We, we can't physically go around and get everybody to fill in a consent yeah. form. So does, can the, the company <coughs> take on liability and say, we, grant you, we guarantee that we give you consent to use footage of our employees? Yeah, you can just say in your contract, in your commissioning agreement, that, you, that they will arrange all the consents and permissions for the people to be filmed or photographed. Uh, also, there's big events that are not necessarily public. So some clients have asked us about, you know, huge events and what they do, whether then there'd be a question about whether it's public or not. And they'll put up signs on, you know, everywhere, like you're now entering this, I don't know, concert or whatever, you will be filmed and, you, you know, you're giving permission. You just have to do the best you can. I'm thinking more into, would they, sorry. And, uh, in, in those circumstances, when someone's going through with a camera, uh, through a place of work and employees are being filmed, I would get waivers from all of them. Uh, I, it does sound uh, mm. very conservative, but if you know, someone then complains uh, and you've got nothing to stand on, mm. uh, who gets the waiver? Uh, I'm not particularly fussed about that. You, you should absolutely get those waivers. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. Should, they, could, should they not put it into their terms of employment contracts for their employees that yeah. there may be functions where you, because I'm thinking particularly of Emirati ladies who don't particularly want to be. Uh, film, but if it's an internal event, there's 250 people in a ballroom where we're filming it on their behalf, um, and then obviously we're going to give it to them, it's for their own use, they might put it on their website, mm -hmm. but there might be people in there that are not very comfortable with having their faces being shown on camera. Yeah. So, but we, want, we don't want that to be our responsibility because it's, it's uh, impossible. So yeah. just get that in writing that they'll get it and, they, and push them to get, this, to get the consents, yeah. It's the business itself that you might be doing the work for is probably, you know, if, if, what, I, th I think one of the things you were saying earlier, back up a bit, is that you've really got to work out at the beginning, before you start any project, what it is you want to use it for. So to have a very uh, sort of full and integrated conversation with a client about what the potential uses are up front will then un lead to an understanding of what can be done, what's reasonable to be done, and then how you do it. And, and I think an awful lot of the problems I see that arise are when people haven't done that initial analysis and worked out what you really, really want to do. So yes, absolutely fantastic, get waivers from everybody. Um, you may not be sure exactly what's in everybody's employment contracts, have they all been signed up on the same terms? You know, is someone gonna go back to a company's HR records? No. You know, so, uh, you, so you have to be aware of what all the potential weaknesses are. And then some of this, you can't abrogate 
back to just the law and the legal process, what it is, because it's completely uh, linked into what you're doing. So your example of filming an Emirati lady, well, be careful how you film and be careful how you edit, because the, the, the issue is identifying people. And you might be able to create exactly the right type of um, uh, atmosphere in terms of what you're trying to show through the video, but carefully edit in such a way yeah. that, 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 that you don't sort of create those issues. But it's about joining up, being very clear what you want to do practically, and joining that up into a discussion around the potential legal issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'll say just on the copyright side, I know it's a really technical point that you want to avoid, but work for hire, which is a very familiar concept to those people who are in the does not work in the UAE. So if I commission someone to do something and I assume that I'm going to pay for it because I asked them to do it, sorry, if I commission someone to do something and I assume that I'm going to own the copyright in, in the production because I've requested it, specifically pay for it, does not work. So that's, that's just a general sort of warning. All you need to do is, it's not difficult, it's an integrity assignment after work has been created, but the standard form contract would say, um, everything you do is create, everything you do for me is owned by me. One more thing to make sure you do right. Any more questions? Harriet? Sorry. Go on. <laughs> um, there's, you said there's no copyright over an idea. But for example, we have clients that say to us, right, we have this challenge. And we go away and spend an awful lot of time and money and effort creating a concept for them of a campaign that they could launch and so on. At this point, we haven't actually made anything, but it's, it's a concept. They then go and take that, give it to three other companies to bid for and give it to the lowest bidder. Mm -hmm. What do they take? They're taking the storyboards, the moodboards, the trademark, the photographs in two-dimensional sketches, drawings. The idea's got to be translated, captured, recorded in some form in order to be able to be given to someone else. If it's just an idea in a game show, um, no, I'm talking about a fairly detailed concept. So if it's written... For example, where they, where a company took, took basically our language and put yes. it into their own RFP yes. and sent it exactly. out to other companies. Yeah. I mean, I didn't do anything about it because I thought, well, well yeah. exactly. but it was yeah. extremely annoying. It does happen a lot, yeah. That's clear copyright infringement yeah. in a literary work protected by the law. So you've got something recorded, you've written down your idea, and someone has lifted that. So do you use copyright note not not that it but it might put you should use copyright notices on all your on all your pitches I'm sure yeah. you do but yeah. just to put people on notice that this is protected content. There's a couple of things you can think about. What well, one is that? I absolutely agree with Harriet. Uh, if, if it's the big idea, if it is for a new game show, if it is the new who wants to be a millionaire, um, then you. Uh, when you're disclosing it, uh, you put in place a contract saying you can't use it. You can't. Uh, if, you, if you're going to use this idea, you've got to come back to us, and then you've got a contract in place, and you can sue under the contract. It's very, very difficult to police those contracts. Uh, I've only been able to litigate one once, but uh, um, that, that 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 occasion, that the guy that's infringed, they, they left a little fingerprint so, so we could go after them. Uh, they're, they're very difficult to police, uh, but at least you've got a contract which says you cannot take my big idea, and you've got to set out what that big idea is, uh, identify it, and so if suddenly uh, some, someone else is starting to produce who, this, who, your, that, the new version of who wants to be a millionaire, then uh, you've got some contractual remedy. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Um, and thank you for your questions, and thank you, Joyce here, Harriet, and, 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 and Rob, for, for, for uh, all that you've taken us through today.